Wait a minute. What? You cannot minimize Zoom when you're recording. Well, then I'll just move it over here. Okay. So the first thing we'll do is we'll, there's a couple different study guides. There is a Jeopardy game that the PowerPoint, I already opened up the PowerPoint like a, right before class. So you guys can go in and either play the Jeopardy game the way it's, um, it's like a hyperlink thing. You can either just go in and play it the way the, instruct, the instructions say, or you can just read through it like it's a PowerPoint. So it's, that's just a, it's just a tool. And there's only, I don't know, maybe a total of, um, it's kind of funny because some of them aren't, it starts out, I didn't create this, this was created by someone who taught several years ago, and some of them start out as just kind of question and answer, but then they get into more just informational, so some of the slides have the correct answer, but then there's some additional information, so it's just, you know, it's a kind of a fun study tool class um, game, so we'll do this one, and then I did make a Kahoot with about 15 questions, um, and I tried to make them separate, um, and then the made the study guide with most of what I think you need to focus on. It's a little hard because your first um, final on the morning is the multiple choice questions. And that's kind of more easy to make a study guide get with, you know, but then the afternoon is your case study. So you have, you know, all of this information with the x-rays and the intraoral, you know, all of that stuff. Oh, that reminded me. Okay, hold on. Stop share, stop share. Um, I have a, I wanted you guys to take a, sorry, I have to totally back out of this. I wanted you guys to take a quick poll for me. Okay, so poll everywhere. If you text this, Les, <laughs> Leslie Harvest, Harvest 501 to 97607. And then if you can answer this question, um, for next year, I'm trying to debate whether or not to do I thoroughly, I thoroughly enjoyed your presentation, but I don't know if it's necessarily the best way, most valuable for you, and that's what's more important. So my next um, thing is I might do case studies throughout the whole semester where we break into groups, do some classroom case studies. I feel like it'll probably be a little bit more practical for running through scenarios um, with people with different conditions and um, as opposed to presentations. So if you think that sounds like now that you have the, the ability to compare and contrast since you did a presentation, if you think that case studies would actually be more valuable as a student, can you vote for that? And if you prefer the presentations and you thought that was valuable, vote for that. I think you just text, so you go to um, Leslie Harvest at five. Oh, I have to activate it. I have to activate it. So sorry. Okay. So, yeah, I think if you put in the phone number line of the, you text. Um, so instead of a phone number, you put this and then you text that. Yeah. Is it? <laughs> Oh, okay. That's the phone number. Thank you. I don't know what you do. One of them goes in here. So instead of a phone number, you put in 37607. And then in the message section, you put Leslie Har Harvest Harvey 501. Is that right? Okay. So one thing that thinking in terms of this case study thing, one thing, because since there is so much content and there's only an hour and 50 minutes, 
I'm probably going, I, my goal would be to only lecture like an hour and 20 minutes max and then have like 30 minutes or hopefully 20 to 30 minutes. I know there's going to be a break in there somewhere um, of working on case studies. So obviously that would mean that it's going to heavily rely on students to, to pre like preload some of that information so you can participate in class. So do you guys think that that is what sounds still, even with that being said, does that sound, we could always lag, like we talked about respiratory diseases week 11, week 12, we do a case study for respiratory. I mean, it could always be stagnant like that too. So it's just, there's so much, my, my um, goal is to always make it less luxury and more active, but it's just really, it's hard because there's so much content. But I feel like, I get the, I'm getting good feedback there. So I, I really appreciate that. Um, Cause I was leaning toward that myself. So I think I'm gonna probably try and go with that next year. All right, thank you. It is everyone in, did you put in, everyone put in their stuff? Okay, it's not, would you say case study? Okay, thank you. I do appreciate that. And I'll take that away and we'll go back here. And we'll go back to our game and we'll get going. Okay, so we're just going to play this just because I don't, we're not going to get too fancy and get into teams. It'll just be, and like I said, some of them, the answers get a little funny. It's the, it's, it's kind of like a mouthful. So we're going to just have this be more like share if you want to share. We're not going to keep, if you want to keep score, keep, keep score. But we're just going to have it be a friendly game here. And I'm going to, um, I'm just going to start and you can just um, kick. So I think I'll just kind of, Start, I should have thought, thought, thought of a way to kick it off and then whoever gets it right can pick another category. But um, raise your hand if you wanna be brave. First Avalon, pick, pick, a, pick a category, pick okay. a number. Okay, for 600, okay. Question, what should immediately follow a purging incident? Rinse with water. Rinse with water. Anybody else? Rinse with water. Oh. I hear baking soda. Let's see. Rinse with a neutralizing solution, which would be water is excellent. Baking soda like this, that'd probably be even more neutralizing and better. So here we go. Okay, great. Someone next. Who wants to pick? Megan. I know. Why might you consider pre medic? Okay, so this isn't sorry. This no, is this is showing this is showing it was written a couple of years ago. I meant to take this one out, but it's not entirely bad. I think to it might not actually be relevant for your final, but it's not bad to still talk about it because you might come into this situation still with an office. So why might you consider premedication for a joint replacement? Because it could happen. It's not, even though it's mostly off the chart. So any, what, any thoughts here? Mm -hmm. Somebody at, at a high risk for infection, yes. Anything else? Compromised, yeah. So they, yeah, they'd be high risk. Mm -hmm. But but similar, but different. Or maybe you want to, like, I think my mom takes the pre-med for some doctors just say, I want you to do this. So sometimes you do just have to. So a comorbidity or if they're immunosuppressed, and I know, there's side conversations. Say, doesn't it still apply if there is history of complications? Like if, the failing? Yeah, so, that, so it is very narrow, but if somebody has had a failed um, joint before, then almost certainly their orthopedist would still want them to do it. And then when the placement of the prosthetic, um, when the place, this one's sort of irrelevant because we used to always say up to two years, up to two years, but now they're 
the dental, the dental world is saying, no, that's not a thing. But sometimes we just do that cover your behind kind of thing and defer to the orthopedist. So, so it's worth kind of talking about just so that you don't give a blanket statement like they don't need that because, well, maybe. Okay, next, who wants to be brave? Raise your hand. Nobody. Should I start picking on people? I was going to pick on you, but then your, then your friend, our eyes met, Emily. No, go ahead, Tasia. Okay, substance abuse patient, what is a typical location for caries? If somebody has been misusing a substance abuse, where might we see some caries? I think, I think I heard it. What did you say? Occlusal, any other guess? The gingival margin. I think that's more where we might be. The buccal mm -hmm. cervical. So a lot of times they're thinking of like meth, the meth mouth, where the um, the if they drink a lot of soda or something, it just kind of um, just like baby bottle carries, it kind of just rests around the cervicular fluid, just kind of hangs out around the, the cervical portion. Sydney, did you have a question or that probably matters, but usually it's it would just whatever it it would probably cause dry mouth and then increase of cariogenic something. So no matter what it is, that's probably the most, but that's a good question for clarification. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like for mm -hmm. OHI, mm -hmm. things like it'd be like cervical things around the mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's where your plaque always yeah. accumulates, right? Mm -hmm. So it's yeah. This is probably more with case studies, I'm thinking. Yeah, this, I'm not exactly sure what let, but just from perusing the case studies, I think this information would be more with the more with the case studies. Okay, next, who wants to be brave? Do you need to volunteer for for two hundred? You guys are too silly. After a chemotherapy, a patient may need pre-medication related to what reason? That's a very good, is that what you were going to say, Bray? Okay, I like those answers. Let's see. What do we have? Immunosuppression. Yes. Good job, you guys. Do you want to pick again or should we go to Bray? <laughs> I know. Yeah, but yeah, we should do it like that. Whoever answers it. Yeah, What's that? What's... So like whoever can answer the question picks the next person. Oh, that's a good idea. Thank you. I always know you guys are gonna come up with a better. So whoever answered it. So it's kind of both you guys, but I think I think Nina, you did answer it. You want you want you to pay? I know she did just fix, so we have to default to green. Mm -hmm. We made eye contact. <laughs> um, OHI logs for the users for Okay, if a patient needs a custom take home fluoride tray, what instructions would you give them? <laughs> hey, <Jeff>. <laughs> 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 logic. You're using logic, Kaiba. That's you're definitely on the right track. Yeah. Yeah, probably not so, Morgan. To clean the teeth before they put it on. Mm -hmm. Oh, to dry the teeth. Possibly. Definitely you're thinking that with um with varnish, right? Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Yeah, don't eat and drink for a certain amount of time. It's hard because with trays, it's probably gonna be a gel. So it's like a custom tray, and then it's gonna be a gel that they put in. So if they get a gel that's um like a neutrosodium sodium fluoride. They're gonna wear it for five to 10 minutes. Um, so Taiba, you got that and that's good. And then no eating or drinking, 30 minutes. So good. 
So I don't know. I think probably at least. I think usually we I tell my patients to wear it for 10 minutes, but sometimes they salivate a whole bunch because it's very kind of sour. And so as long as they can stand it, but and then spitting thoroughly, but not rinsing it away. Good job. Okay, Taiba. So then you have to pick somebody to pick or you pick. What was it? So Taiba picks a person or picks a category. It wasn't, it wasn't my idea. Someone else's idea. Whoever just answered the question. Taiba answered the question the most correct, I think. Or, or, or take the last question. Okay, general levels of blood glucose, too high to provide service, too low to provide service for um, blood glucose. Tally. Anybody? I hear a seven. Oh, sorry. Okay, go, Olivia. Pick somebody. Oh, yeah. So it. So I think there. This question is probably that because this is if they have an A1C of um, seven, right? So I'm thinking that when they wrote this. It may be the person, maybe perhaps the case study, maybe it says something about their A1C. So they're allowed to have a little more of a leeway. It's just 200, because I think the 250 is only if they have an A1C on document. So they have a little bit more of a leeway to go up a little high. But if they don't, yeah, and that's I think that's geriatric. But if but if they don't have anything, then the cutoff is lower because if we know that their A1C is typically um, like a decent, like seven or seven point five, then we can give them a little bit of a wiggle room. But other than that, it's the cutoff of two hundred. Okay. Okay. So, oh shoot, I lost where we're at now. Charity would pick last, right? Olivia answer it. So then Olivia has to pick the next person. How do you achieve stress reduction during a dental visit, dental hygiene visit? So what are some ways to help reduce patient stress? Some breathing exercises. Nitrous is a good one. Essential oils. No screaming children in the operatory. Take away the triggers so they can see them. Yes. What about some things about scheduling? Early morning appointments. Early morning. Keep them short. Okay, let's see if we got those answers here. Schedule appointments in the morning, minimize waiting time, behavioral guidance techniques. I don't know, we didn't like super go into depth in there, but avoid stress triggers, administer adequate pain control, that'd be your nitrous, and local follow-up with post-operative pain and anxiety control. So um, call it like building rapport, calling your patient, talking to them, how does, how does your appointment go? It's like building that trust that sometimes also helps them with the stress of the next one. So, okay, good. Okay, next, someone pick another one. Hi. <laughs> I want to do POC modification eight. Uh, uh, okay, tricky one. Hemophilia. Not that we talked very much about blood disorders. Hemophilia. What process of care modifications might you need for a hemophilia? So, mm -hmm. 
anything that you, what about like when you actually have them in your chair for treatment, anything that you, somebody who bleeds a lot. Uh -huh, INR and the prothrombin time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so he they don't clot. Right. He, so yeah. He yeah, no, yeah, so yeah. that's probably not it. But we but we do want to think about their clot time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you want to be careful. Is it start? I see a hand. Do you, what do you think, Kelly? Oh, yeah, with a high area of aspiration. That area of, mm hmm mm hmm Good, those are good. I thought I saw a hand over here. Did she say what you were thinking? Consult the physician. I'm sorry, Danny, say it again. Mm-hmm. So let's see, let's see what we have. Definitely starting, so consult with a physician, that's a, and obtaining the INR and the prothrombin time. And then patients should um, have replacement factor administered prior to treatment per their MD order. So we really didn't talk about blood disorders like sickle cell and hemophilia and things like that. Um, but there, there would be a protocol with that type of patient that they'd be very much under the care of their physician. Um, and their ability to clot would be established for sure. But just like somebody who might be taking like opposite, like someone who's taking a blood thinner, like a warfarin, you do want to be sure that um, you're cleaning in these small segments, like you guys were talking about, you want to make sure that you kind of start in the area of least inflammation that would likely be the place that might bleed the least of anywhere and see how they do, see how they're clotting, that sort of thing. Understand platelet alteration, drugs, how um, things like certain herbal medications that are blood thinners or aspirin, those are your big ones that can alter um, um, coagulation, avoid the PSA and the IA. So that was good too. So we might do infiltration instead of these injections that tend to get a high um, occurrence of um, positive aspiration. Okay. Another one. Okay, I'm just going to start picking. Alco <laughs> alcoholics may be on which medications to assist with treatment? Guys, remember this from? <laughs> what might an alcoholic take to make them not want to drink? Do you remember any of the names? Hi, <laughs> bud. Thing. Yeah, this is a good one to have because this is one of those questions where it's like, thank you for helping me study that because otherwise that would have never entered my, it, it induces, it makes them really sick. Yeah, so when they take these medications, it makes them really sick. A, Anna, it depends on if you're talking about the generic or the brand. T is another one. Okay. Okay. Probably doesn't even. Remember. This is the one that everybody. Um, oh, wow. An abuse is the one that I always think about. It's because it's like don't abuse alcohol and abuse. Um, and then this is the other one. Now check zone. Is that what you were th yeah. saying? Yeah. I didn't. I know I didn't quite hear you, and I was like, um, I don't know. Um, so trexane, trexane and an abuse. I think they that's the way you guys would rec keep recognizing recognize them through their um, these terms, their generic terms. 
Okay. Uh huh. It makes them really nauseous and sick when they they get really sick when they take if they're taking those medications and then. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. OHI. So if someone has end stage renal disease, what specific OHI considerations may um, you have to consider for someone in end stage renal? Mm -hmm. That's it's important. Yeah, to keep meticulous OHI. Uh, something about their diet. Something about their diet with renal. And they um, also might be thinking too of just the urea, like the high uric acid in the calculus buildup too, perhaps that might be triggering some of that. Um, uh huh. What's that? Dry mouth? Yes, potentially, because yeah, there's a couple, there's many things that can contribute here to oral um, manifestations. So some of it, the main thing is they might be on a restricted um, diet, but, and they also can't just guzzle a bunch of water. So they might have a lot of um, dry mouth. So may present with uremia, which can contribute to an acidic oral environment, um, maybe on a renal diet, which um, restricts fluids and sodium intake, limits dietary phosphorus and potassium, which may contribute to zero stomach. Oral hygiene instructions do not recommend more fluid and that would be kind of counterintuitive because we always think like, what's the fine water? But not for somebody who's an end stage renal. That would be the last thing you'd want to do. Okay, let's go up here. Prescription medication recommended. So now, can you think of what your normal numbers are for prothrombin time and the INR times if somebody is um, on an anticoagulant? I got a two, a two and an O, oh, two and 20, two and 20. Any other guesses? Two sounds, two sounds like a good number. Maybe. <laughs> is that your, is that your guess? 1.1, 1.1 and under, and then because the numbers are different for P, for prothrombin and for INR, they're different values. One is smaller and one is bigger. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we're three and 20. So INR less than three, but a normal one. So like somebody who like doesn't take anything might be more like one and a half or something. But if they are taking these things, they just want them at least to be under three. Um, and then prothrombin time less than 20 seconds. So they should be plotting in less than 20 seconds. So these are, these are probably like the highest that they could be considering somebody who had some kind of a condition or is on a medication. So all of us might be lower than that or higher or whatever. Okay, so three and 20, just have those in your head. Most common Parkinson's medication. What's the most, what's the Parkinson's medication that comes to mind? Yeah. I, for some reason, I just felt confident you guys would have that one. I feel like we covered Parkinson's pretty well. So dopamine replacement is the levod um, levodopa or the carbamidopa, most common. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and then, there, and then here's some just extra information on Parkinson's that you may want to add to your study. Um, sometimes this is a treatment, the deep brain stimulation. I don't feel like we covered that super. Um, complementary supportive therapy, such as physical therapy and these different therapies, a diet rich in fiber, um, behavioral management. So these are all um, tricyclic antidepressants. These are other medications too that they could potentially be on. But this is gonna be levodopa is, your, is the most, um, one that should really come to your brain first. POC modifications, Parkinson's disease. Why would you need to implement modifications 
to the process of care for this patient. So what's something that somebody with Parkinson's might struggle with that would really impact the dental hygiene care? Holding, Holding stuff for sure. That's one thing, Kelly. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Trembling, tremors in his yeah. tongue. Yeah. Yeah. Nick. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Yep, they're like a kind of a little bit of a weakness or tremoring in their tongue. Anything else in the oral cavity that you can think that might directly be affected by something we do pretty often? One of those, my favorite words to say, not really. No, close. Um, dysphagia. So they have difficulty oh. swallowing. I always think it, I'm always like, should I say phagia or phagia? I don't know. So I always, that word always, I fight it in my head before I say it. But here's several things you can see. We talk about like the muscle weakness. So um, difficulty like coordinating. So all of these tremors are gonna um, kind of affect their oral hygiene and their movement in general. Um, but dysphagia is gonna definitely, if you're using water or something, um, tongue thrusting, tremors in their tongue, lip pursing, um, drooling, not so much because they have excess saliva, but because they have trouble swallowing. So it's just the saliva will come out that way. That's the sialuria, um, muscle rigidity, um, rigidity um, brachykinesia, so slow movement, postural instability, and then cognitive if they're, um, if they're at that stage. So there's several things that could be affected depending on what stage of Parkinson's they have. Okay, pre-medication. When, when is pre-medication needed for prevention of possible infective endocarditis? I think this is kind of a weird question. I'm not sure I would know how to answer it. When is pre-medication needed for prevention of possible infective? I guess it's asking like what, what patients are at risk of infective endocarditis? I don't think I like this question. No, there's, I remember a specific where I had like a question like, when is pre medication needed for prevention? That's for sure. If they have a history of it, you would definitely do it again. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. So, what do it say? So, previous history. Well, there you go. Um, artificial. So, this is kind of like who's, who, who needs it, basically. So um, history of um, infective endocarditis, artificial heart valves, congenital defects um, with residual defect near prosthetic device, cardiac implant that has developed a problem with the heart valve. So almost anything that has anything to do around a valve or prosthesis or history of infective endocarditis as well. And I, I have another, in the Kahoot, I have another more, even more specific one because there's a phrase related to this that wouldn't jump off the page as super familiar for me. And so um, I wanted to highlight it to make sure that the phrase was like something that you guys would recognize as being linked to possibly needing a pre-med. And you'll see what that is after a little bit when we get to it. So common oral impl um, implications when, when an antidepressant is being administered, I guess this seems like an incomplete thought here. Common oral impl implications when an antidepressant dot, dot, dot. <laughs> Zero stomia, yes, that's one. I would, any, anything else anyone can think of? Bruxism, that's a good one. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's see what we got here. So here's the, um, the antidepressants that you'd like, the tricyclic and the 
SSRIs, um, and then here's what is typically associated with them. So xerostomia, bruxism, platelet effects for the SSRIs and the NAOIs, and orthostatic hypotension. Um, I think bruxism is probably one that you really want to be, be sure you are remembering that. That was a good one. Okay, OHI 200, describe a neutralizing mouthwash. We talked about that earlier. Baking soda and water. Good. Baking soda and water is your neutralizing mouthwash. Pregnant patients, modification for nitrous. Can pregnant women have nitrous? Not in the first trimester. And can they have it in the second or the third? In like certain amount, right? Um, modification for radiographs. What do we do? What do we worry? What do we think about with that? They can have radiographs. Mm -hmm. Patient. Yeah, like a um. Yes, I was gonna call it a diphtheria. That's not it at all. Um, it starts with a D. The, dosimeter. Dosimeter. It's a dosimeter. That's what it is. So yeah, they can have dosimeter, but also um, obviously we want to try and avoid the first trimester unless it's like some kind of a crazy emergency. And then in general, they don't, unless it's an emergency, they don't typically need them. They can usually go without, but they can have them if, if they need to. And what about modifications for medications? Can you think about... Um, Mm hmm certainly. And I'll just give you this heads up. What about an antibiotic? What antibiotic would you definitely not want to give a person who's pregnant? Tetracycline. There you go. Good. So, so here are some um, things, some kind of big points for pregnant patients. Um, consider safe um, in the second and third trimester if you're keeping it down to less than 30 minutes. I mean, back in the day, they gave women nitrous when they were giving birth to calm them down. So it's, it's okay to, you know, have a little, but we just, you know, want, obviously want to use it very specifically. I know it can't hurt it at that point. Right. Um, but definitely not early on because they have had links to, um, miscarriages too. Medicaid or modification for radiographs only when clinically necessary to 18 weeks is when they're the most susceptible so really not in that first trimester and then only if it's really necessary, even though they have said that it's generally safe. There's such a little amount of radiation. And then epinephrine, like um, somebody said, aspirin for sure, NSAIDs, um, tetracycline, and then, then some other ones here, some of these um, CNS depressants and barbiturates. Okay. Miscellaneous seizures. How long before you activate EMS and the length of seizure in status elliptica. So it's kind of a two-parter. So how long would you wait before you'd call 911 for someone with a, or if it's just a medical emergency? I'm not sure if it would be first or if it would just be if they're having a seizure and it's not stopping, how long would you wait? Like five minutes. Five minutes. Right away. Is that what you guys learned in, yeah, in medical know. emergencies? Well, that's good. That sounds like good advice. What about status elliptica? Do you guys remember about how long that? Okay. Um, if a seizure lasts longer than three minutes, um, and then, but for static elliptica, you always call EMS with this one, right? Well, nobody's waiting 20 minutes. Yeah, nobody's waiting 20 minutes. And, and you wouldn't probably know anyways, like if somebody, so it's more just, this is more book knowledge like this kind of epileptic seizure is longer lasting and they really have to deal with it in the hospital. So it's not like if somebody started teasing, you'd be like, I think this is a status elepticus and this is gonna last 20 <laughs> minutes. You just would call EMS. But just for knowing the, um, that these last longer usually and they have to be dealt with in the hospital. So for EMS, so if it keeps going longer than three minutes, if the patient doesn't stop seizing, but I like that answer. I'd probably be calling 911 no matter what, because unless we, unless you have a really good talk with your patient beforehand and they're like, I can, I go into seizures quite easily and this is what happens, you know, and then they know kind of give you an idea of what to expect.
If it's not normal. Yeah, they know what normal for them is. And so as long as they can kind of share that information with you, that's very helpful. Okay, last two here. If a patient needs pre-medication for prophylaxis, how many days must the appointment be apart and explain why, not on the final exam, but important to know. That's funny. Um, so I do remember this coming up though, because I think I had a, a test question earlier and people were like, why does it matter? And so um, I guess it's good to dissect that. But anyone know how, how long do we tip it? So when I was in private practice, we always separated appointments of scaling and root planning by a certain degree. Trey? nine to 14 days. So generally we always were like two weeks and it, we didn't even give the patient a choice. We just said, we'll do your first, we'll do your left side. And then two weeks later, we'll do your right side. And the reason that they do, because anyone have a guess of why we do that? For the pre, for, so not everyone obviously gets pre-med who we scale and root plane, you know, for, we did everybody at two weeks. And some of that is just healing. Like we get to see some results from the left side of the mouth and compare it to the right. But if they're taking a pre-med, the reason is because they, they don't wanna encourage antibiotic resistance. Um, so I don't know if it just gives the body a chance to like settle down after having a day of antibiotic. It gives your gut time to reflourish its natural microbes or something, you know, I'm, I'm, this isn't my area of expertise, but I think that's the general philosophy is give your body some time to balance back out the microbes before you give them it again. So about two weeks roughly in between doses. Okay, describe an oral malignant manifestation of HPV 16, 18. This is another one that I don't know that we like, we hit hard. Did you say that, say it again? The purple, the cauli, I heard cauliflower, but the purple lesion? Oh, oh, you're thinking of carposi sarcoma? Yes, that is, um, you might see this also in that, but that's um, generally seen in AIDS patients. So that's a good one to know too. You wanna know that one too. The Carposi sarcoma, that's like a real purpley lesion. But I heard the cauliflower. So that's the condyloma acuminate. Cauliflower like lesion commonly occurs on the ventral tongue, gingiva, labial mucosa. I had a teenager that had one on the buckle, like right on the patella. And I was like, that was what it really looks like to me. And then the doctor just had them, um, referred them to an oral surgeon. And they usually just, I think, I don't know what they do with them. I guess they remove them, I guess. But so condyloma acuminate, um, and it looks kind of like um, this kind of cauliflower-like lesion. And this is um, or like the, a wart, an or intraoral wart. It's HPV. And a lot of times the oral cancers um, end up being the HPV um, 16 and... Um, what was the other one? 16 and 18. Okay, so I'm going to get us out of this one and I'm going to pull up the Kahoot. That'll be a little more fast paced. And then we're going to call it a day. There's only 15 questions. So that'll go pretty fast and then we'll be done. So let me close this. I like how we all like. Are you trying to get Holly to come? Yeah. yeah. We're like, oh, we're like somebody go get Holly now. Yeah. yeah. We're like, okay. Turn this this time. That's too funny. I first. You did it last time. Brenda did it last time. I know. So what has someone said? Oh, you said Well, you said Well, you'll be there today. I know. I know. We're allowed to use our notes. I will call. 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 I
We have it on the table. Yeah. Will you tell everybody because I'll listen to you that Holly said we can do it when we're done. We just all need to be in here. We can do we can the Q and A early. Oh, yeah. just everyone has to be in the room. Yeah. Okay. We just tell everyone. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Holly said she will start Q and A as once everybody's all in the room. So she can start early. I can let her know when I'm done. I can go tell her I'm done. As long as everyone's in here, she'll come in and start to make. So then this one, you just go to this and put it in and I'll someone put in my name? Yes. Who's that? Girly girl. <laughs> Have you guys watched that show on? I don't know if it's Netflix or Prime, but it's about an octopus. Yes. Have you guys seen the octopus? Yes. It's so I never want to eat octopus again. Oh, I've never eaten an octopus, but it's so that 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 you guys will be able to pull from with the case studies i think a lot of that's going to be um a little bit more on your kind of pull it from now some of your clinical experience um the study guide i was in first <laughs> i was trying to give you some instead of like right you know so i'm not writing down like a question that would be like exactly like what the exam questions are but still guiding you a little bit so you're not um 
Because there's a lot. I mean, there's like what, 400 questions altogether? So there's a lot. But that's also a good thing because you can miss more, right? There's more uh, margin for error. But um, I think it's going to be good. I have, I think I had, I have 50 special needs in the morning and 50 special needs in the afternoon. So then Kristen is the same. It's, yes, yes, yes. Do the whole the whole game? Oh, okay. Yes, yes. Okay. Mouth breathing may be seen. Sorry if I write weird questions, but I did this fast. Mouth breathing, mouth breathing may be seen in which condition due to several oral anom anomalies. So there's several things going on in a person's mouth who has this condition that may, and one of them may lead to mouth breathing. I think I gave 30 seconds for every question. I know. Sorry. Good job, you guys. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. Speaking in a loud tone would help a patient with autism feel more comfortable. False. Yeah. So, so shouting at somebody um, is not generally a way of calming them or making them feel more comfortable. Question number three, multiple sclerosis is considered a developmental disability. Multiple sclerosis. Is this a developmental disability? False, it is not a developmental disability. So some of these, you guys, I've posed these because there might be questions on the exam where knowing this is very helpful in specifically answering that question. So these are all, these are all very thought, like specifically thought out questions. So make sure you kind of put those, that information to memory. A patient, I know it kicks the people out sometimes. A patient could lose consciousness with the following disorders, disorders, except which one? So which one would somebody generally not lose consciousness? This is a weird question, but once you kind of know the answer, or if, if you pay attention to, I'll help you. I'll help focus us in after this. Right. So you guys, so the majority of you answered correctly. Someone with hyperthyroid, sorry, I spelled it wrong. Um, the roid or the vagoid hyperthyroid. But what I do want you to focus in on is somebody with epilepsy very likely could possibly lose consciousness. So let's know that for the exam. But hyperthyroidism, um, so someone could lose consciousness with diabetes. They could lose consciousness, with, obviously, with syncope because they have fainted. Um, <laughs> when treating a patient with hemophilia, the dental hygienist should always take their blood glucose, encourage mindfulness, scale one area at a time, checking for clotting, offer a cookie. Good. Good job. We already talked about that. <laughs> you all get a cookie. Cystic fibrosis is most likely considered a blank condition. Respiratory, heart, neuro neurologic, or hormonal. 
Cystic fibrosis, what is one of the major organs that's affected with cystic fibrosis? Several organs are affected, but there's a big one, like a main one. Respiratory, it, that's good. The lungs, the lungs are a big part of cystic fibrosis. Okay, which antibiotic would you not give a pregnant woman? Yes, tetracycline. We don't want to give that. That can um, permanently discolor the baby's teeth when they grow up, and it's not pretty. It's not pretty at all. So most people know that for sure that you don't give tetracycline. Okay. Children is what kind of a disease? Somebody who has Children's um, syndrome has a heart disease, autoimmune disease, neurologic disease. Intellectual disability. It's an autoimmune. Children's is an autoimmune. Good job. Gold fishy. Could cerebral palsy exhibit facial paralysis? So if somebody has cerebral palsy, they exhibit facial paralysis. True. Yes, they could. So that is. One, so there might be other things, a question on the exam might talk about other things that cause facial paralysis, but cerebral palsy is, would be one of the options. Uh, it is ideal to treat a diabetic patient after they have eaten a typical meal and taken their medications, true or false. So they've taken their typical medicine, they've eaten a typical meal, then we would wanna see them. True. So when, so you wouldn't want to see a patient if a diabetic patient came and said, well, I haven't eaten yet and I haven't taken my medicine, that'd be a big red flag, right? Because we wouldn't want, we wouldn't want to see them. So thinking about protocol with our um, patients with diabetes is probably going to be relevant for the exam. Trexane is used for patients with blank, trigger finger, depression, migraines, alcoholism. So Trexane and Anabuse, good, good job. If you suspect child abuse, you should do the following, report your uh, suspicion, make a chart note, tell the dentist, tell any coworker. Report your suspicion. Very good. We're mandatory uh, reporters. So we, and remember, it's just a suspicion. So you're not accusing anybody. You're just potentially helping um, somebody. So it's um, reporting. And then does unrepaired cyanotic, so here's the one, cyanotic congenital heart disease require premedication? Do you feel like this was a term that maybe would just pop into your mind? Cyanotic congenital heart disease require premedication. The answer is yes. So that's that's a tricky one. So just even though this is not something, it's a congenital condition um, that would probably require some kind of uh, repair. And so just be familiar if that if that term pops up on the exam, you know that that's usually a, that's a patient that would need a premed. So I just wanted to kind of hand that to you because that's not generally something we don't think, you know, we think of like valve replacements, like we think of these kind of blanket terms, but cyanotic congenital heart disease, but it is on the list. Antidepressant medications can lead to increased halitosis, salivation, bruxism, sugar intake. Brexism, good job. Last one. Um, diazepam may be given during emergency involving what type of patient? So I didn't feel like this was a totally like, oh yeah, I know this one without a little bit of diazepam, uh, relax, kind of CNS depressant. 
Nice. Good. Oh, yeah. Wow. Good. Thank you very, very good. Yeah. Yay, yay, yay. And I never got the top five. Yay. Happy Dee. Happy Dee. Happy Dee. Happy Dee. Happy Dee. Happy Dee. Good job, you guys. Very good. So look at these tools. Look at your study guide. You're all going to do fabulous. I just know. I'm going to post the, I'll post the recording, but I'll also post the link in the, uh, for this Kahoot in week 15 so you can play it again if you want to, or you can just watch the video.